Muy bien. Ok. Ahora sí, ya estamos en Facebook. En Facebook. Olfa, I'm going to introduce you to the audience. Right now we are on Facebook. Ok, Olfa, I will speak in Spanish for a while. Ok. Ok, muy buenas tardes a todos. ¿Cómo están? Eh, gusto en estar nuevamente en un webinario de nuestra Asociación Mexicana de Ultrasonografía Crítica y Urgencias. Estamos transmitiendo para Latinoamérica y en general para todo el mundo. En este momento desde la ciudad de Monterrey y nuestros invitados que en este momento les voy a presentar. Eh, a nuestra invitada especial desde París, Francia, y, a, y uno de nuestros colegas también, eh, profesores de nuestro grupo, el doctor Raimundo Guerrero, el cual se encuentra en este momento en Tepatitlán, Jalisco. Él es parte de nuestros profesores, que también imparten cursos en nuestra asociación. Y estamos muy contentos el, el día de hoy, porque tenemos a una, una invitada pues, muy especial, como todos nuestros invitados, que ha accedido a compartirnos su vasta experiencia desde París, Francia, en un tema por demás interesante, al cual hemos agregado a esta programación de webinarios en nuestra tercera temporada. Y pues bueno, estamos, estamos realmente ya, ya listos y preparados para iniciar este webinario. Un saludo a todos nuestros amigos de Latinoamérica, especialmente en Brasil, Colombia, en Bolivia, en Perú, en Argentina, nos, nos está viendo y escuchando mucha gente de aquel lado, al cual le mandamos muchos saludos y desde luego a todos nuestros colegas aquí en México que también nos siguen a través de nuestras redes, a través de nuestro sitio en Facebook, que asisten a nuestros cursos y que también están entusiasmados con la ultrasonografía crítica. Y bueno, les presento a Raimundo Guerrero Sigala desde Tepatitlán. ¿Cómo estás, Raimundo? Un abrazo. ¿Qué tal? ¿Cómo están? Juan Antonio, doctora Olfa, buenas tardes. Buenas noches por allá en París. ¿Todo bien? ¿Todo tranquilo? ¿Todo tranquilo? Estamos Pero... pendientes de aquí de la, del webinario y cualquier cosa estamos a su orden. Perfecto. Y él nos estará acompañando junto con la doctora Alfa para los comentarios al final. Y bueno, pues les voy a presentar a nuestra invitada, la doctora Olfa Hamsui desde París, Francia. Ella está eh, trabajando en el Hospital Beclerc en París. Ella es parte de ese fantástico grupo de médicos franceses que junto con su esposo Jean-Luc Tibol y, me, y muchos otros colegas han publicado una gran cantidad de artículos eh, en el campo de, la, de lo que es la hemodinamia, del cuidado crítico y y ha participado en infinidad de consensos, ha publicado muchos artículos muy interesantes en nuestro campo, y bueno, en esta ocasión ha accedido a compartirnos su experiencia en este tema de lo que es el uso de los betabloqueadores en pacientes con sepsis, un tema por demás interesante que ha generado hasta cierto punto cierta controversia, que hay importante literatura, y bueno, pues quién mejor que una experta en este campo para hablarnos de este tema peculiar. Así que, doctora, thank you so much for accepting our invitation, Olfa. Uh, we are very, very happy for having you. Um, and let's get started with your conference, uh, Olfa. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Juan. Thank you, Romando, for this nice invitation. I'm really very happy, very honored to be among you uh, this noon uh, to for the all the Latin American uh, people Paul hearing me and I'm really very, 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 very ple ple pleased to be with you. Thank you, Olfa. Thank you so much. Let's get it started. Thank so you. So my talk today will be first in uh, SEPSA. My first um, question will be uh, about the sepsis and the beta adrenergic activity. So uh, sepsis is often associated with large increase in catecholamine expression leading to an increased glucose metal metabolism, hypoglycemia, increased catabolism of skeletal muscle protein. This is in response to invading pathogens and is due to an upregulation of the sympathetic activity. Uh, this effect, metabolic effect, is mediated mainly by the beta-2 adrenergic uh, receptors, and this is so a beta-2 adrenergic effect. This was nicely demonstrated by uh, Lang and collaborators in this old study who infused propranolol, uh, which is a non-selective beta adrenergic antagonist uh, in uh, septic in rats, septic rats, and uh, observed that there was an attenuation uh, which was 
uh, induced in the basal glucose turnover by around 70%. In contrast, the atenolol, which is a selective uh, beta-1 uh, antagonist, did not alter uh, the glucose metabolic response to infection. This means and suggests that the adrenergic stimulation probably mediated by a beta-2 adrenergic mechanism, and it is partially responsible for the sepsis-induced increase in global metabolism. So another effect of the beta adrenergic uh, activation is the, pro the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines. And uh, this also was elegantly demonstrated in this experimental study by uh, of, uh, monocytic cells with uh, beta-2 uh, adrenergic receptor agonist, they observed uh, an increase in the production of uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines like uh, interleukin 1 beta and interleukin 6. Uh, also, the activation of uh, the beta-2 adrenergic uh, receptors may lead to uh, immunomodulatory effects, also always via beta-2 adrenergic uh, effects. Uh, this old study uh, reported uh, the, adrener the repartition of beta adrenergic receptors on a human lymphocytes, and the authors reported that are mainly on the beta 2 adrenergic uh, uh, receptors. The adrenergic system also modulates or regulates cell death, mitochondrial function, and inflammatory signaling. So one of the most uh, frequent, important, and scared effects of the activation of the beta adrenaline receptors are the cardiac effects. Why? Because it leads to tachycardia, mainly by the beta-1 effect, which risk, risks a decrease in left ventricular filling because of the shorter diastolic time and in stroke volume. Also, it leads uh, to an increased contractility always via the beta-1 effect. This two uh, phenomena will lead to an increase. This also may be harmful in patients as uh, demonstrated in this study by Sander and co-workers who uh, included patients with a heart rate more than 95 beats per minute for a period more than 12 hours in at least one 24-hour period of uh, their ICU stay. They investigated the cardiac events and more precisely in the high uh, in the cardiac high risk patients and they observed an increased incidence of major cardiac events for the group of patients with a prolonged period of tachycardia so we are uh, always we agree all or all of us that tachycardia is harmful for uh, critically ill patients so if this adrenergic stimulation persists, uh, adaptive mechanisms may occur, and this will lead to a downregulation of beta-1 adrenergic receptors, like the desensitization, decreased density, hyporespensiveness of beta-1 adrenergic receptors, and depression of post-receptor signaling pathways. All these effects will lead to cardiac dysfunction, and it was also uh, demonstrated that these effects are mediated by uh, cytokines like interleukin-1 and tumor necrosis factors. So what about introducing beta blockers for in experimental sepsis in order to decrease these uh, beta adrenergic stimulation? So the potential interest of using beta blockers in sepsis is firstly to attenuate excessive tachycardia and thus to improve the left ventricular diastolic filling and stroke volume and to attenuate the increased myocardial oxygen demand and its inherent risks. To reduce also the pro-inflammatory cytokine release and to restore beta adrenergic receptor density and responsiveness. So I will talk about two agents, mainly two agents, and one of them is ismololol, 
because it is recently, it was the agent which was uh, more frequently uh, uh, studied in uh, experimental and even in a human studies because of its, um, because if it's cardioselective uh, beta one blocker, and it is involved mainly in the control of heart rate and contractility. It does not block the beta two adrenal receptors on myocardium, bronchial muscle, large coronary, and so on. Uh, cardioselectivity is relative rather than absolute, and then therefore it is dose dependent. But what characterized this agent, it was, it is a fast acting, rapidly reversible, and a very short half-life, around two minutes. So 55% of a smaller binds to uh, plasma protein. And this is why it is suitable for short-term administration during unstable conditions. So uh, in experimental studies, this is one of them uh, where they were, uh, so a septic shock model by uh, uh, sequel ligature and uh, puncture to imitate uh, peritonites in animals. And in this uh, study, uh, compared to animals in the sham group, the CLP group, the septic shock model group was associated with increased plasma levels of EL6 and EL10. The addition of a smolulol at all tested doses in animals that underwent CLP resulted in a decrease in the, these inflammatory uh, mediators, the interleukin 6 and 10. Another interesting uh, result of this uh, study is that it studied all the complete anti-inflammatory pattern. And what they observed is that there was a real modulation of the inflammatory pathways using the small oral in the septic shock model. Another experimental uh, from a Chinese group uh, in 31 also septic rats uh, who were randomly allocated to a control group, low dose and high dose of SMLR. So what they reported first result is that the density of beta-1 adrenergic receptors is higher in the SMLR treated group. The second result is that SMLR decreased TNF and interleukin-1 beta blood concentration in septic rats. The third result is that both cardiac work and cardiac efficiency in the smaller treated rats were significantly higher throughout the study period versus the control group. Another study from a French team in Nancy by Bruno Lévy, who also studied a septic shock uh, model in uh, animals, and uh, they compared, when compared to the sham operated animals, the CLP animals had uh, hypotension, but also a cardiac depression. And when they added a small oil, they increased cardiac contractility. So uh, they concluded that smaller prevents the sepsis-induced myocardial depression. They also observed that a smaller restores the sepsis-induced hyperactivity of small vessels. And this is maybe about via the upregulation of the alpha-1 adrenal receptors in small vessels. So the key message of this paper is that the ejection of a small oil blunted the increase in cardiac and vascular inducible nitric oxidase synthase protein expression and also of the NFKB expression induced by sepsis. The ejection of esmolol enhanced the generation of anti-inflammatory cytokines while decreased that pro pro-inflammatory cytokine. Another result of the, the same study, there was a longer survival period for uh, the animals treated with a small oil in the septic shock uh, animals treated by a small oil compared to the uh, control group. So 
Uh, now let's move on to another agent, a new one, uh, which was introduced just recently. It is the Landeolol uh, uh, agent. It is also a selective, but it is a higher selective beta one blocker. It has compared to a smaller, it has a faster onset and shorter half-life, four minutes versus nine minutes. Uh, compared to a smaller level, the beta-1 selectivity of landiolol is eight times higher than uh, that of a smaller level, which is resulting in a ratio of around 255, and landiolol has a more profound negative chronotropic effect and a less degree of negative inotropic and or hypotensive action. And this is why physicians were interested in this age, uh, agent because it can prevent hypotension for patients with septic shock and they are already under uh, norepinephrine. So what are the studies that um, mention this uh, agent? There are not a lot of literature uh, yet about Landeol. I found this experimental uh, study. Uh, in this study, the authors investigated whether Landeol can attenuate the acute lung injury and cardiac dysfunction in a rat model of endotoxin-induced uh, sepsis. And what they found is that the co-treatment with a selective beta-1 adrenoreceptor blocking agent like landiolol protects against acute lung injury and cardiac dysfunction in a rat model. The other result is that the treatment was associated with a significant reduction in serum levels of the inflammation mediators and also of histological lung damage. So this is the, about the experimental studies. Now it's great and it is really exciting all these results of the experimental studies and the use of beta blockers in such a study. So, but what about beta blockers in a human sepsis? So, of course, the potential interest of using beta blockers is the same as in the experimental studies to attenuate excessive tachycardia, to improve left ventricular diastolic feeling and stroke volume, and attenuate the increased oxygen myocardial demand and its inherent risks. This is one of the first uh, studies, uh, so the human studies, uh, appeared in uh, 2006 by um, Gore and colleagues who studied only six patients, what they call moderately uh, septic patients uh, with uh, mechanically ventilated and with pneumonia. Before and then the, conc the, the conclusion of a three hour infusion of a small oil of sufficient dose to reduce heart rate by 20% from baseline. What they found, they found, of course, heart rate was decreased by uh, more than 20%. So there was a significant decrease in heart rate, but what is also um, probably uh, surprising is that there's also a decrease in cardiac index. So I think we can, uh, question ourselves about the benefit of this, uh, of this um, agent in such conditions where we observe a decrease, a significant decrease in cardiac index. Another study more recent by the, uh, the team of Morelli in Italy. So it is the first, the pilot study about the effects of a smaller in septic shock patients. It is so a larger study because it was dealing with 25 septic shock patients. They were included after 24 hours of initial hemodynamic optimization with a heart rate more than 95 beats per minute. And also they were all requiring norepinephrine to maintain mean arterial pressure more than 65 millimeters of mercury. There was so a titrated infusion of a smellular to maintain heart rate, heart rate less than 95 minutes. So what are the results of this study? Yes, there was a decrease, a significant decrease in heart rate, 
but also a significant decrease in cardiac index. This is also something which we may question ourselves about the benefit in these conditions. There was also a decrease in oxygen delivery, which probably is not a good thing in such conditions. Yes, there was a beneficial effect on microvascular uh, microcirculation, and this is uh, by a significant increase after 24 hours of a smaller infusion of the microvascular flow index of small vessels. There was also a de significant decrease in the heterogeneity, heterogeneity index, but not all the microcirculatory variables have a significant difference. So I think the microcirculatory effects are not so obvious. And uh, so the, this pilot study encouraged the team of um, Morelli to uh, conduct a larger study, the randomized study, multicentric uh, study. So 154 patients included, 77 in the group of a small and 77 in usual care. And they included so septic shock patients with uh, norepinephrine, but after always after 24 hours of resuscitation from septic shock. So what are the main results of this study? Yeah, of course, there was a significant decrease in heart rate in the smaller group. The mean arterial pressure was more or less stable. I say more or less because Statistically, it was not significant, but if you uh, follow the, uh, the kinetics of, um, of the mean arterial pressure, as you see in the smaller group, it's not so stable uh, in this, um, in this uh, group of patients. The other, uh, this, the, the, the other, Result main result is that there was an increase, a uh, significant increase in stroke volume index because there was also a decrease in heart rate. So this is one of the effects of the beta blockers. This was also shown in other studies, uh, the Morelli 2013, but also in uh, Balik and co-workers, in Schmittinger and co-workers, and Gore and Wolf and co-workers. What are the other results of the study? Uh, the stroke volume, yes, increased, but cardiac index. So in the paper, cardiac index is not uh, significantly different from the control group to a smaller group. But when you see the trend of the cardiac index, it is uh, being decreasing from uh, four for less than 3.5. There is a trend of decrease in cardiac index. And this uh, was associated to a decrease in DO2 and also in VO2. I don't think that these effects are beneficial for septic shock patients. These effects also were, were also observed in other studies, uh, in the Balik study, the Gore and Wolf study. So they are really uh, real effects of a small oral in such conditions. So we need always to question ourselves about the uh, beneficial effects of beta blockers in such conditions. If we look uh, closer to the results that what we can see uh, in the population of patients treated by a small olor, they had a significantly lower amount of uh, volume of fluids infused during uh, the three four first days of resuscitation. Uh, this probably means that hypovolemia was probably not well corrected, but because it was not uh, also well diagnosed because uh, the tachycardia, which is one of the, uh, one of the uh, signs that tell us about the volemia of the patient were, was masked by the beta blockers. So, I'm not also sure that uh, uh, masking hypovolemia in, in these kind of patients in the early phase of septic shock will be very beneficial for patients. Uh, 
the Morelli study showed one of the main results, even if the mortality was not of the uh, primary outcome, but there was a significant uh, difference between mortality in the smaller uh, group to the compared to the control group. But look at the results. And when you see uh, the rates of mortality, I don't know if you are surprised, but I'm really surprised and even shocked about the rates of mortality. When you, in septic shock patients at 28 days, the control group of 80%, hospital mortality at 90%, there are, these are rates of mortality for uh, cardiac arrest and not septic shock patients. Of course, the smaller uh, group also is uh, also uh, increased. They are high, the rates of mortality between 50 and 67%. They are really very high rates of mortality. This is one of the main critics to the, to the study. And uh, also, moreover, when you look at the population at baseline, they were not so they were not so severe because if you look at the lactate at uh, inclusion, the patients had 1.5, 1.9. They were not so severe. So of course, uh, Andrea Morelli, they ex he explained in the paper that there was an epidemia of um, pseudomonas and that they killed uh, the, a lot of patients, but we still uh, question ourselves if we can extrapolate these results to our patients. I'm not so sure. And I'm not, I think, the only one. And this is why the new agent is also has been tested uh, in the, such conditions. And the landerol, because it has a uh, lower risk of hypotension, it was uh, studied in some um, uh, uh, cases of septic uh, patients, uh, especially in Japanese groups, and this is one of the study, which is a, a retrospective study, a single center, so it is a historical cohort. Patients who were included, they had a Sears score more than two with uh, infection, and they had a supraventricular tachyarrhythmia in, uh, with heart rate more than 120 uh, beats per minute for more than one hour. What they found when uh, treating uh, these patients uh, with um, landiolol, there was a rapid and substantial reduction of heart rate in the landiolol group, and the landiolol did not change arterial blood pressure. Another interesting result is that uh, landiolol did not affect cardiac index, as we, sh we saw in the studies for a smaller room. But you should know this is a retrospective study, a very limited uh, number of patients. Patients were not under vasopressors. It was not the septic shock patients, and it was not the initial phase of resuscitation. So we don't know about uh, the, the introduction of this agent in conditions of septic shock. This is why there is a going on a trial which is uh, going on in a multicentric trial about the landiolol in patients with septic shock. Authors aim to demonstrating that uh, the administration of uh, landiolol in septic shock and persistent tachycardia is effective in uh, reducing maintaining heart rate without increasing vasopressor requirements. And it will be a multi-center, prospective randomized, open-label controlled study. Uh, we, we, they will enroll around 200 patients with septic shock, as defined by the third international consensus. Uh, they will include patients with a tachycardia more than 95. Uh, beats per minute, and the primary endpoint will be the heart rate response. The maintenance, therefore, uh, of this heart rate and the absence of increased vasopressor requirements during the first 20, uh, 24 hours, which is uh, a very important issue. The study will investigate uh, whether heart rate control using glandular is safe 
feasible and effective in septic shock patients. So I think we need to wait for this trial in order to introduce beta blockers in uh, septic shock patients. We already wrote a paper with Jean-Louis Tuboul about the paper by Morelli. And at that time, we already positioned uh, the, the paper. It, it has uh, definitely boosted the interest of critical care physician for beta blockers. And I think there is a, an interest for introducing beta blockers uh, in septic shock patients. But uh, this study raises more questions than it answers, uh, because it is tempting to believe that a beta-1 blocker like a small oral is valuable in hyperdynamic septic shock patients with marked tachycardia. But nevertheless, the potential of this drug to decrease cardiac output and oxygen delivery must be acknowledged uh, so that the administration in septic shock with hypodynamic states should be at least cautious and even avoided in those cardiac failure. We need a large multi-center randomized clinic trials, probably with a smaller or probably with the new agent Londiolol in order to confirm the positive results and the effects, uh, the beneficial effects of beta blockers in septic shock. And muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Orfa. It was an amazing presentation. Thank you for Thank you. giving us this amazing webinar. Let's move on to the questions and comments from the audience. Eh, Olfa, I'm going to speak in, in Spanish, ¿ok? Eh, bueno, pues eh, vamos a pasar a, a las preguntas y comentarios de nuestro auditorio que nos está en este momento viendo y escuchando a través de nuestra página de Facebook o bien a través de esta plataforma de Zoom. Eh, les saludamos a todos, eh, especialmente allá en Colombia, nuestro amigo, el profesor Butch, también nos está, nos está escuchando. Y pues bueno, eh, no sé si tuvieran algún comentario en audiencia. Este, Raimundo, ¿estás ahí? Sí, aquí estamos. Sí, eh, no sé si quisieras hacer algunos comentarios o preguntas en lo que la, la audiencia nos hace algunas otras. Sí, ¿qué tal? Bueno, eh, siempre interesante el tema de, de sepsis con muchas vertientes. Evidentemente, la forma inicial, la reanimación, el uso de vasopresores, qué tantos líquidos, qué tipo de cristaloides, eh, en este caso, beta bloqueador. Eh, considero, al menos particularmente, que esto todavía no hemos dilucidado cuándo iniciarlo. Eh, la pregunta va para, a, en este rubro. Si iniciar junto con el vasopresor, ya que prácticamente eh, en varias series el, el 80% de los choques sépticos o la sepsis e inician con taquicardia, ¿no? Que sea un patrón o un valor del, de la respuesta inflamatoria. Es iniciar, iniciar eh, de forma, valga la redundancia, inicial con vasopresor, beta bloqueante y reanimación al mismo tiempo. No sé si, si por sí. ahí sería claro. la... Vamos a, a preguntarle. Olfei, eh, Olfa, uh, one of the questions uh, that is commenting our colleague is about the timing of Esmolol or, or any other beta blocker, the timing to start uh, this, this beta blockade in this kind of patients, because uh, it is mentioned that uh, in, in some papers or even in the, in the, in the paper of Morelli, that the, the Esmolol should be uh, started uh, in the in the late phase of, of sepsis, uh, you know, because sometimes we don't know exactly the timing for initiating this uh, beta blockade or, or this, this drug. What is your opinion about it, uh, Olfa? So um, it's a, a very interesting question, and it, I think it's uh, also very hard to respond to this question. Morelli, uh, in the study of Morelli and co-workers, they uh, introduced uh, the beta blockers 24 hours after the resuscitation, the first resuscitation of uh, septic shock. It was not really a later phase. It was always uh, in the in the we will say the first phase. It's not the six first hours, but it's uh, still the, the 24 hours. And uh, and what we saw that there was a, a really negative effect on DU2, VU2, cardiac index. So 
I don't know that, I'm, I'm not sure that uh, in the first 24 hours when patients are, uh, all, are always hypovolemic, they need probably some uh, fluid. This is why they are tachycardia and they have, um, of course, uh, probably uh, an inflammatory response, but I'm not sure it's the, the right time to introduce uh, this kind of uh, the beta block. I think it, it must be uh, later than 24 hours. And we must be sure that uh, volemia is well corrected, that there's no other um, uh, cause for uh, tachyarrhythmia, and that or mainly patient is really stable uh, hemodynamically. And why I'm talking about landiolol, probably the new agent, which is less uh, hypotensive than a smaller oil, maybe it will be beneficial and maybe we will have a less requirement of vasopressors and less uh, effect, uh, negative effects on cardiac index and DO2, VO2. And this agent probably, it may have its place in, in the around the 24 hours, but a smaller oil at that uh, now with this literature, we, I cannot say that it can be uh, introduced in the the first 24 hours or just after 24 hours. I'm not sure it is a, uh, something we can uh, make really safely. Exactly, Olfa, thank you. Y, eh, I'll speak in Spanish. <coughs> de hecho, bueno, la, la doctora ya ha hecho algunos comentarios sobre, eh, bueno, este estudio, eh, el, el beta bloqueo, eh, el estudio de Morel iniciaron 24 horas después y se menciona mucho que después de la optimización hemodinámica, como ha dicho la doctora, incluso después de descartar hipovolemia, pero a veces la pregunta que surge es eh, ¿cuáles son los parámetros o en qué nos vamos a, a basar para decir que el paciente está realmente eh, hemodinámicamente optimizado y qué, qué métodos o recursos vamos a utilizar para efectivamente establecer que, el, que la condición es segura. Eh, Olfa, one, one question that arises in this uh, setting is, uh, uh, it is mentioned that we, uh, after or, or, or uh, I mean, before starting the beta blocker, uh, we should uh, be sure that the patient is on their hemodynamic optimization, okay? But uh, what are the, the criteria that the patient should meet uh, in order to establish that the patient is really hemodynamic optimized from your point of view? Yeah, uh, I think, as I said, hypovolemia. We need to, to see if the patient is uh, preload responsive or not. This is something which is important. I think it's really a main question for uh, this, um, for to to introduce uh, uh, beta blockers. I think this is one of the of the main thing to be uh, that you, you need to be sure about uh, before beta blockers. It needs also uh, that the patient would be hemodynamically. I think. It's Table on uh, the amount of vasopressors that we are not in the, you know, in the ascending part of increasing doses of vasopressors and patient is still not stable uh, and vasopressor requirement is increasing. So uh, I think we need that we will be on the phase rather than the, the phase ascending, it's the descending phase and we are weaning vasopressors. Right. The third thing, as I, as I showed in the Morelli study, that there is a, a decrease in cardiac index. So we should have at least a hyperdynamic state. So we should have a cardiac and higher cardiac index. If the patient, for example, is in a, a septic shock, but with a low cardiac index because they ha he has a, a septic cardiac dysfunction or he uh, has a decompensation of his cardiac function, I think it's not uh, a good uh, thing to introduce at that moment beta blockers because it will decrease more the cardiac index and DU2 and VU2. And I'm talking about a small oral. I, I, mm -hmm. I need to see about bland dialogue. Exactly. And actually, Dr. Morelli has, in many situations, has mentioned that, and actually he, he has given an example of, of, of his patient under higher uh, doses of vasopressor and higher doses of, of dobutamine. And even in that condition, Dr. Morelli recommends, uh, if I am not wrong, of course, uh, he recommends uh, uh, smolol 
despite the using of high doses of, of dobutamine. In your opinion, Olfa, uh, is it correct to initiate a, a beta blocker in, in patients with dobutamine, or should we combine uh, the use of levosimbendan, for instance, on, on milrinone? Uh, what is your opinion about the, the combined use of beta blocker and an inotropic drug if the patient needs the, the inotropic drug? I'm not sure it's the good way to to do. I'm not, I'm I, I'm not sure really. Uh, I don't have experience with this because I don't use beta blockers when I have a high dose of dobutamine. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, even if patient with tachycardia I would use, uh, of course, uh, we can switch on to levosimandan or to a milrinone. Uh, so an anotropic, uh, anotropic drug with a less uh, tachycardic effects or uh, uh, just uh, also use amiodarone uh, to uh, uh, decrease the um, heart rate. So, uh, of course, uh, I think I, I understand the position of Andrea Morelli because um, he has uh, the two studies. He's really um, uh, someone who will defend his results. And so it is understandable. But if you look at the literature and uh, Obviously, we don't have other studies that demonstrated these positive and enthusiastic results. So I don't think we have sufficient data to say that we can use it safely, uh, the smaller in that in such conditions. Exactly, Olfa. And, and what are we following, uh, Olfa? Uh, the, the heart rate by itself with the use of beta blocker, or we are uh, searching for another benefit mechanisms from your point of view, Olfa? So uh, it is the heart rate, of course. Why we focusing on heart rate? And I, as I explained at the beginning of the of the, this uh, presentation is that heart rate will lead to uh, all uh, the problems that can happen to the, um, to the cardiac myocyte. Why? Because we will have uh, first um, uh, a real stimulation, uh, 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 complete stimulation and uh, a substantial stimulation of beta adrenergic uh, uh, receptors that will lead to hyporesponsiveness and uh, a down regulation of beta receptors that will lead to a cardiac dysfunction. So we need to treat tachycardia because we want to prevent the cardiac dysfunction uh, which, can, which may result from this. Also, tachycardia is not of course, it's not a good situation for patients because, as I said also, because the diastolic time is short and the filling of the left ventricle uh, is not uh, is not um, uh, very it is not making very well, and so this is why we have also a hard situation for the left ventricle. And if we decrease the heart rate, we allow a, a better feeling of the left ventricle uh, because the diastolic time will be uh, increased. And so we have uh, a better, of course, cardiac output and a better cardiac function. So the heart rate, as you say, is the first uh, puzzle of all the problems that can happen uh, after le uh, from, from this uh, adrenal, adrenal receptor activation. Exactly, Holfa. And one question, is that sometimes Olfa in our units, uh, speaking uh, about our Mexican units, we lack of esmolol, but we have la betalol. And do you consider la betalol is a good option in this case, or, or can be uh, an, an option instead of using uh, esmolol if we only have in our units la betalol, for instance? So uh, I. I really do not even advise a small in uh, mm -hmm. for the moment because I think we don't have enough data to to uh, to, to advise to recommend this. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure it's uh, the, the best track. And uh, why uh, labitolol? Uh, it, it 
it seems for me a little bit also in such conditions, I don't know, uh, not for critically ill patients, I'm speaking about septic shock patients at the initial phase when they are very tachycardic, you know? Mm -hmm. Labitolol it, it doesn't have the, uh, the same pharmacokinetics as a small oil, and it is not, it does not have a, a short half-life and it's not uh, fast acting. And also uh, if we stop the effect may be a little bit uh, prolonged. So uh, it's not very well adapted for septic shock patients. We can use it in critically ill patients, but for other uh, uh, cause of tachycardia, mm -hmm. yeah, but right. not in septic shock in the early right. phase. And even for a smaller, I'm not sure, even if you don't have a smaller in your units, be mm -hmm. sure we have a smaller, we don't use because we are not sure about the effects and we are very, very cautious about it. Yes, of course. And actually, I am not sure if we have in Mexico Landiolol. I am not sure if someone in the audience uh, knows if we have uh, Landiolol in, in Mexico. But I, I am not sure if we have uh, Landiolol. Eh, eh, Raimundo, no sé si quisieras hacer algún otro comentario a la doctora mientras eh, paso también algunos comentarios ya de, de, la, de la audiencia que nos están haciendo varias preguntas. Raimundo, ¿tienes algún otro comentario? Eh, sí, bueno, eh, también parte de la audiencia comenta o uh -huh. hace llegar. Eh, sí, sí. Es, está bien, pacientes que no tienen taquicardia, pero es igual están sépticos y demás. Si el efecto asociado del, del beta 2, o sea, bloquear los receptores beta 2, nos podrían ayudar, por ejemplo, un selectivo, un beta 2, nos pueden ayudar a la disminución del estado inflamatorio. Eh, ok, ¿en dónde está esa pregunta? ¿Quién la hace, Raimundo? No la veo. Eh, Ah, perdón, me la mandó este, Uriel, que también está aquí. Ah, ya, ya. Y, pero la, la mandó en forma personal, ¿verdad? Así es. Ah, ok. Entonces, me, lo que él pregunta es si el uso de otros beta bloqueadores podría ser sí. útil, hablando, por ejemplo, de, de propranolol o, o metoprolol, por ejemplo, sí. orales, él, centrales. Él, él comenta el butoxamina, que sería un beta-2 selectivo propio, ah, okay. específicamente sobre el, el estado inflamatorio. Butoxamina. Okay, Alpha, uh, do you have some comment about uh, the using of uh, butoxamine, for instance? Uh, not butoxamine, no, but I know that the propranolol and the uh, metoprolol also, mm -hmm. yeah. Also, the, the, we have old studies that study the inflammatory effects of these um, of these uh, beta blockers in uh, mm -hmm. in septic experimental septic and patients we don't have about human patients, uh, human mm -hmm. studies. So uh, they were interesting results for in uh, septic models in animals. And uh, uh, of course, uh, people were uh, interested about these inflammatory in septic shock conditions, but uh, unfortunately we cannot um, use this in uh, septic shock conditions because they are not adapted uh, for patients who are unstable hemodynamically also. Exactly. Because yeah, we cannot titrate the infusion. They are also they have a long half-life uh, yes. time, so we cannot uh, really um, uh, use this for um, for septic shock patients. Exacto. Y de hecho, yo creo que una de las de las principales obstáculos o retos que tenemos para el uso del beta bloqueo es que no tenemos las infusiones infusión ultracorta, hablando del andiolol o el esmolol, eh, comentábamos hace rato, pero muchas veces el gran problema que nos enfrentamos es que ni siquiera a veces tenemos el, el, las herramientas de monitoreo hemodinámico, hablando de monitoreo de gasto cardíaco continuo, etcétera, desafortunadamente, que creo que esto debería ser una condición eh, sine qua non para el uso de, de, de los beta blockers. I am speaking in Spanish, eh, Olfa, about the, the tools that, that we should or we must consider when we are are giving uh, ultra short acting uh, beta blockers speaking uh, specifically about the cardiac output monitoring sometimes in our units of, unfortunately we lack of advanced tools but in my opinion th this should be a, a mandatory requirement okay yes uh, yes, yes 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 sure continuous monitoring yeah Sure, I'm, I'm really, uh, I agree with this. I think it's very important because as you see in Morelli study, the cardiac index, it 
goes uh, down when introducing beta blockers. So mm -hmm. we need to monitor really uh, very closely. If you don't have uh, the uh, advanced monitoring like the transpulmonary thermodilution devices, for example, mm -hmm. to have the, you can use echocardiography, yes. Echocardiography exactly. to have, yeah. To, mm -hmm. It's not a monitoring device, but it can, uh, you can repeat the measurements and you can have an idea about the, right. uh, about the evolution of the cardiac output. And I think it's, it's very very uh, important and just uh, I, I just i want to add a commentary for the mm -hmm. uh, propanolol and these uh, beta blockers that were used for the inflammatory uh, the one the selective uh, the selective uh, beta one uh, beta blockers they have First, they have a, the effect on tachycardia, and this is the most and the scared effect of the um, beta uh, adrenal receptor activation. This is why we uh, now we move to the uh, beta one selective blockers and not uh, to the um, to the, the the beta blockers that are not selective or that they use uh, that they are just. Um, concerning the beta-2 adrenal receptors. Uh, because, uh, and in the small study, the experimental studies, they have also inflammatory uh, effects. And as you see, there was a decrease of the uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines in a lot of experimental studies. Uh, this is because the dose, uh, the, um, the, the, the selection of the beta one or the beta two, it depends of the dose of the, of the oh, beta blockers of the drug that is mm -hmm. administrated. So beta one is selective, but if you increase doses, you will have also the uh, beta two, uh, uh, beta two effects and the mm -hmm. uh, beta two effects and the um, also the inflammatory uh, effects uh, mm. of the beta blockers. Yes, and, and de, y de hecho, bueno, también alguien nos está comentando. Ahorita vamos a leer cada una de las preguntas. De hecho, Raimundo, ahorita me vas a ayudar con algunas preguntas de la audiencia. Pero alguien, por ejemplo, está comentando sobre el uso de la propafenona o la miodarona, es decir, que no son quizás beta bloqueadores, pero que tienen un, un efecto sobre la frecuencia cardíaca. Incluso hablando del de de la dexmedetonidina, lo cual también sería interesante preguntarle a la doctora. Olfa, someone uh, from the audience is questioning, Dr. José López, uh, is questioning about the use of another drugs, which maybe they are not beta blockers, but they have the same property of heart rate decrease, you know, for instance, propafenone, amiodarone, or even dexmedetonidine which uh, have a uh, heart rate uh, decrease effect, but we, we don't know if, if this can be uh, beneficious or helpful for our patients in sepsis. In sepsis. What do you think about it? Uh, I think if we are uh, sure about uh, the optimization of the hemodynamic situation of the patient, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, we do it in all our units, if the patient remain very, very tachycardic, and uh, we think that it will be uh, deleterious for his uh, situation, mm -hmm. we uh, try to decrease the, the, uh, the heart rate by uh, other uh, drugs like the amiodarone. And I think we can use the, the amiodarone in such situation. The problem of the amiodarone is, uh, is that it's not a problem, but this is uh, the property. Mm -hmm. It's not always uh, efficient. So not mm -hmm. like the beta blockers, mm -hmm. when you uh, infuse beta blockers, you are sure that the heart rate will decrease and we will maintain decrease. Yes. The amudin has not the same effect. They are But not so course, predictable. Uh, They are not so predictable. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. but of course uh, we can use amiodarone in such situations yes. because they don't have the hypotensive effects. Yes, because sometimes, for instance, we have patients under dexmedetomidine sedation, yeah. and they and they are showing um, bradycardia, or they are simply they are not tachycardic, and this can be a, a helpful effect in. in of course. The Okay. Of course, yeah, okay. yeah, of course. Yes, of course. and th there are many, many questions from the audience. Do we have time enough, Olfa, for the questions uh, from the audience? Oh, are, okay, okay, several, okay. Yeah, there yeah. are several, several, okay. several este, questions. Eh, Raimundo, ¿quieres leer alguna de las preguntas? Si quieres, empezamos por la, de, la del doctor Víctor Francisco Raimundo, si me haces favor. Víctor Francisco. Es la primera de Víctor Francisco. 
Eh, comenta el doctor Víctor Francisco Izaguirre, eh, en el paciente con choque séptico, específicamente con taquicardia, arriba de los 120 latidos por minuto, eh, ya ha reanimado tanto con cristaloides y el uso de vasopresores, eh, suponiendo que tenemos una presión arterial eh, con, con objetivo, ¿no? 70, 75 media. Lo más importante es la vigilancia del paciente. En este caso, eh, el ultrasonido nos podría ayudar tanto a vigilar la bulemia como el gasto cardíaco y de ahí poder modificar el, el uso del, del beta bloqueante. Sí. Sí, 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 yo creo que es algo de lo que hemos comentado. Alfa, one person from the audience is questioning, when, well, he's commenting, he's not questioning, but he's commenting on the use of other tools in case we don't have a cardiac output monitoring, etc. And the use of uh, the, the volumia or the, the volume statues by using uh, other tools such as echocardiography and so on. And well, I, actually, I have a question uh, for you uh, in this uh, specific topic, Alfa. Uh, What do you think, uh, uh, speaking again about the hemodynamic optimization, does the, the, uh, the, the patient should be in the, uh, in the ascending part of the Frank Starling curve or in the flat part of the Starling curve uh, to consider the patient is, uh, uh, is candidate for use uh, beta blocker uh, alpha? What do you think about it? I think it is better that the patient is in the flat part of the because no at that time yeah mm -hmm. not not responding because at that time I'm mm -hmm. uh, I'm really uh, uh, I'm really very um, happy about the situation and I'm saying I'm not masking hypovolemia and tachycardia is not a response of hypovolemia but uh, it is a response of uh, uh, the beta adrenergic uh, stimulation and uh, this will uh, justify my uh, my treatment if I decide to but uh, I'm not yeah. sure now, now. Right, okay. Uh, Carlos Garcia is uh, giving us a, a, a question in English actually and the question is Hesmo, well, the comment, the comment is Hesmolol has another issue. It requires a regular volume of infusion. And the question is, does this landiolol, does landiolol need a fairly regular amount of volume of infusion? Maybe he's talking about the dose of landiolol. Uh, and do you, the other question is, do you use the OPF evaluation, I don't know what is OPF, ah, okay, OPF evaluation of microcirculation of arterial venous PCO prints, you know, or uh, uh, venous oxygen saturation in your regular practice, maybe for titrate these kind of drugs? Yes. Yes, um, uh, the first uh, the first part of the question, just uh, remember me is yes. The the question is about the amount of volume of infusion. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, the amount of volume. Mm -hmm. I think it's mm -hmm. uh, we, we we don't. It is a. Uh, The, the trial is going on and this is phase four. So uh, it's not, um, I think it's arriving just now in, in France. And uh, actually I will have an appointment with one of the representatives of the, uh, of the, um, of the Landiolol uh, pharma pharmaceutic uh, uh, lab. Um, but I think it's the same, uh, the same way as the administration of a smaller, it needs regular administration and continuous infusion. And uh, because it, it is also, pra it is really very practical because um, uh, it is like also other um, other drugs like the vasopressors they are they need um, a continuous and a regular infusion and it is also on off uh, effect so when you switch off you don't have you don't have no more the effects and this is what we what we need if you have a, mm -hmm. a complicated situation exactly for the For the monitoring, so uh, we don't use the OPF for the microcirculation, you know, the, the tongue, but we, I, I use uh, actually frequently, uh, of course, I measure the SCVO2 and also the uh, CO2 gap 
uh, yes. to to in order to optimize the hemodynamic mm -hmm. treatment in, uh, in in such patients that remain, yeah. for example, uh, in a hemodynamic instability um, despite of. Uh, 65 or more than uh, 65 uh, millimeters of mercury of arterial pressure. So uh, I use uh, this yeah, frequently in, um, in, uh, in my unit. Yes, of course. Um, we should use all the, the tools that we, we have at this moment yes. in order to optimize the hemodynamic condition. Sí, eh, Carlos García, él, él, este, pues ciertamente, como tú has escuchado, eh, la doctora nos habla de que ciertamente pues, recomienda cualquiera de estas eh, herramientas que tengamos para optimizar el estado hemodinámico. Y de hecho, si hay alguien en la audiencia en este momento de México que nos pueda decir si ya tenemos la andiolol, en nuestros hospitales, ya sea públicos o privados, porque, en, por ejemplo, en el caso del esmolol fue retirado la infusión, el, la presentación para infusión continua, no las, las, las ampolletas de un mililitro, sino los, los frascos grandes. Eh, el laboratorio, que por cierto era mexicano, eh, o que lo estaba eh, aquí distribuyendo, ya, no lo, ya lo sacó del, de la circulación eh, del mercado. Entonces, ahora estamos batallando para... Eh, beta bloqueadores de, de acción ultra corta, pero si alguien por ahí en la audiencia o tú Raimundo sabes si, si el andiolol está disponible pues nos puede ayudar y bueno el doctor Pedro Adán nos, nos dice que si el índice de variabilidad de pulso y el eco transtorácico, la velocidad de la raíz de la aorta, de la aorta etcétera, el BTI nos puede ser útil para la, la, la optimización hemodinámica, yo creo que ya hemos platicado de eso, yo definitivamente sí eh, bueno, otra pregunta en inglés. Ah, es del mismo doctor Carlos García. Do you think alpha that beta blockers has a role in myocardic depression induced by sepsis that presents with diastolic dysfunction? Uh, uh, and this is the, the, the first question. And or in, patient, in patients with basal cardiac insufficiency uh, with type 2 or type 3 diastolic dysfunction. Maybe he's uh, meaning that if you consider uh, useful the, the, the beta blocker in patients with increased left ventricle feeling pressure, I think. Obviously, I think that, you, that it is very helpful, no? Yeah, but no, but in the, um, these are other kind of patients, but of course, when mm -hmm. you have a diastolic dysfunction, it is uh, better to have a lower heart rate uh, and in order to uh, improve the feeling of the left ventricle. And so uh, beta blockers, of course, may be uh, useful, but it depends on the situation of the patients. If it is not, in, is not stable uh, hemodynamically, probably we cannot uh, use the um, <coughs> use the beta blockers, even if they have a left ventricular uh, diastolic dysfunction. So, uh, and we can use other uh, probably drugs to just to decrease the heart rate and not to uh, deteriorate the left ventricular dysfunction function. So uh, I'm not sure that patient, uh, because he has a left ventricular dysfunction, uh, diastolic dysfunction, he needs to be mandatory on uh, beta blockers when he is in septic shock. I'm not sure it's a, a, a good way, uh, a, a good thing to, to do in these competitions. But if it's stable and the patient still have the, the left ventricular diastolic dysfunction and uh, has a uh, elevated heart rate, it is, of course, uh, it is, um, uh, something which is recommended to uh, decrease his heart rate to, in order to improve and not to de deteriorate his diastolic dysfunction. Yes, actually, there is a, a very interesting paper from Filippo San Filippo and Antoine Villarreal yes. speaking yeah. about the diastolic dysfunction yeah. Yeah. in critically yeah. ill patients and how, how to, 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 uh, to, to deal with. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, another opinion is well, another question is about the use of the simultaneous use of beta blocker plus levosimend and something that we were speaking about it, uh, the, the use of both drugs at the same time, simultaneously. What do you think? I, I really don't have a experience about the two drugs together, uh, mm -hmm. but I, I, I just say uh, pay attention to uh, the hypotensive effects. Because, yeah, because levosimendan is also uh, has a, 
uh, vasodilatory effect also and may uh, decrease the, the arterial pressure of the patients and beta blockers also uh, can have the same effect. Even the small oral can have uh, probably the same effect. So I think we need to pay attention. Where, yes. when, but I don't have uh, a lot of experience with this with mixing the two drugs together. Exactly. Actually, we should be cautious about the using of levosimendan in, in order to not to be confused because there are some papers about levosimendan in patients with septic with neg negative results. But actually, you wrote a paper and our comments, an editorial, or I, it was a comment with your yeah, husband. Yeah, but it is a letter, a letter, yeah. a letter to, uh, yeah, because it was a response of the paper by exactly. Gordon. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. Gordon about the negative effect, negative study about levo, the use of levosimendan in septic shock, and um, our concern was uh, mm -hmm. we are we were really um, not very happy about the interpretation of the data exactly. by Go Gordon and co-workers mm -hmm. because the uh, uh, the, re the conclusion of the paper is that levosimendan is not. Uh, beneficial for patients with septic shock, but uh, in his paper, he didn't uh, study the patients with a low cardiac output and a low cardiac dysfunction. There was no, uh, no any echocardiography exactly. for these patients. So you mm -hmm. cannot, you cannot uh, try to, uh, you know, um, uh, see awesome. the effect. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. see the effect of a drug if you don't select the right patient. Exactly. Uh, so this is why uh, mm -hmm. we, we wrote a letter. It was really very, we were yes. just a little bit um, uh, irritated about the, about the results. Yes, I, actually, I think that the key factor is the the, the good or or the the appropriate selection of the patient in a specific this topic uh, combining levosimen. And actually, doctor doctor Gordon answered that uh, echocardiography is sometimes is is not available and and <laughs> you know, but and yeah, actually, but, but, uh -huh. but you know, in our we don't have the same things to uh, the same mm -hmm. way to to think. But mm -hmm. uh, in our practice and uh, all almost the, all the French units, when we mm -hmm. uh, we need to introduce an inotropic drug, we need mm -hmm. to have a, a, an evaluation, a cardiographic evaluation exactly. of the patients yes. before and after. I don't introduce the butamine if I don't have echocardiography. And exactly. if I don't have, a, I, I cannot introduce it, the butamine exactly. or levosimendan or any drug. We don't have the same way to think, I think. It's not, uh, yes, actually, I, I'd like to underline this uh, in Spanish. Doctor, la doctora Alfa está comentando precisamente la importancia del uso de la ecocardiografía antes o, y después del uso del inotrópico. Creo que para toda la, la, la gran escuela francesa que nos han eh, dado excelente y vasta literatura, siempre nos van a recomendar que eh, cuando se usan vasoactivos, especialmente eh, inotrópicos, debemos de estar apoyados con estudios como la ecocardiografía crítica. Bueno, eh, también, eh, bueno, esto fue una pregunta del doctor Misael. Eh, eh, Raimundo, no sé si quieras le leer la, la pregunta del doctor Boris Vides. Eh, el doctor Boris, desde Bolivia, saludos. Eh, comenta, ya hemos hablado sobre cuándo iniciarlo, qué tiempo iniciarlo y en qué pacientes. Sobre todo, ¿cuándo lo quitaríamos? ¿Cuándo suspenderíamos el beta bloqueante? Sería algo importante. ¿Qué tanto tiempo mantener la frecuencia cardíaca y, ah. y cuándo quitarlo, verdad? Yes. Actually, uh, one question, Olfa, from uh, a, a participant from Bolivia is, is commenting about the timing or when to stop the beta blocker. That actually is a very common question and, and we don't completely uh, the answer for this kind of question. Uh, that's why we need further investigation but yeah. uh, uh, the, the timing about the stop when to stop uh, beta blocker do you have some comment about it no no because <laughs> I, I think i no because i think uh, for the moment we cannot initiate the beta blockers so i'm mm -hmm. not sure that we we can speak about uh, when to stop but uh, but something uh, to be serious, something which is, I think, um, important, we need to monitor uh, the cardiac index. And if you see if the cardiac index is going down and decreasing, you need to stop uh, the, the infusion of, um, of uh, beta blockers. I think this is one of the 
uh, main adverse effect that uh, that we need to monitor, <coughs> and it is a criteria to stop uh, mm -hmm. the beta blockers. And uh, of course, if we are, uh, um, I think the in the Morelli study they had a uh, uh, ninety. Six hours of infusion of uh, mm -hmm. ACL, if I'm not uh, wrong, uh, mm -hmm. and they didn't have they didn't study the uh, prolonged effect of beta blockers more than uh, uh, three or four days. So I'm not sure we have uh, data about a prolonged effect. So I think it's it's not uh, it's around uh, 96 hours. Uh, I think the maximum uh, period that we uh, we administrate. Yes, we, we lack of enough data about uh, to give some recommendation about the duration. Yeah, of, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's difficult. Okay, and uh, José López nos, nos dice de la presentación de Smolol de 2.5 gramos. Efectivamente, existe esa, esa, nosotros la llegamos a tener aquí en México y específicamente donde estoy yo en Monterrey, llegamos a tener la presentación para infusión de laboratorio que les comento mexicano, pero desafortunadamente se, se eh, la de dejaron de, de, de dar, no, no está ya, no la encontramos en ningún lado, al menos en, en, en aquí en Monterrey, pero le agradecemos a José López la, el dato, que desde luego es muy útil, pero ciertamente esa misma presentación es la que no encontramos, no está circulando, al menos aquí en Monterrey, no sé si en otras partes de la República. Y, bueno, well, eh, eh, Raimundo, no sé si tengas algún último comentario ya para finalizar este, esta sesión. Sí, ¿qué tal? El comentario como tal es dejarlo que tanto inotrópicos como beta bloqueante, como todas las medidas que tenemos para, septi, para choque séptico, que se han estado eh, el más severo, es vigilancia, el monitoreo. Y considero que el, la ecocardiografía llegó para quedarse, ¿no? Llegó para, para guiarnos. Tanto así que ya hay guías como tal para optimizar los, los eh, inotrópicos, ¿no? Como dobutamina o levosimendan. Yo creo que tanto estos beta bloqueantes como las próximas medidas que hagamos eh, será con ecocardiografía o monitoreo eh, quizá en vacío. ¿no? Sí, claro, el uso del monitoreo monitoreo es básico. No, no, concebi no concebimos eh, el uso de estos vasoactivos sin un monitoreo adecuado, ya sea preferentemente continuo o bien a través del eco, pero sí, sí es importantísimo porque son drogas que hay que estar a, a pie de cama, o sea, las veces que yo los he utilizado, no te puedes separar hasta no ver que verdaderamente no, no tengan efectos adversos, porque puede ser incluso a, a amenazante para la vida, ¿no? Hay que estar siempre en el, con el uso de estos medicamentos, estar pegados ahí al paciente, minuto a minuto. Y bueno, pues parece que ya no hay, por último, creo que se agregó una, no. Eh, bueno, pues con esto les vamos a, a dar fin, eh, fin a este webinario. Agradecerte a ti, Raimundo, desde luego por tu participación, muy contentos por habernos acompañado y a todos los que nos están escuchando y nos estuvieron eh, viendo a través de nuestra re, eh, página de Facebook o a través de esta plataforma, decirles que este webinario permanecerá como todos los demás on demand, ¿verdad? Para que los vean en cualquier lugar, en cualquier momento, están continuamente en nuestra página de Facebook, en la pestaña que dice videos, ¿verdad? Para que no se confunda en la página de la Asociación Mexicana de Ultrasonografía Crítica y Urgencias, viene una pestaña que dice videos, ahí vienen todos estos webinarios que son, si no me equivoco, más de, más de 30 con grandes personalidades, como en este caso no es la excepción, la doctora desde París, Francia. Uh, Olfa, uh, we are really, really honored by your participation. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. We were very, very happy for having you. I don't know if you have uh, last words or take on messages or some uh, uh, words, last words for our me uh, medical and physicians in Latin America, Olfa. I think uh, we should, you should not worry about not having a small oral in your units. I think uh, we don't have enough data to uh, introduce a small oral in septic shock patients for the moment. Uh, wait for the larger studies, probably a new agent and uh, probably uh, more convinced, we, we need to be more convinced about the effect and uh, to, to introduce these drugs in such conditions. So uh, this is my uh, key message uh, for uh, all of you today. Thank you, Olfa. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank you for spending part of, the, of your time with us. I know you have children. They are waiting for you. <laughs> Thank you, Olfa. Uh, and best regards, 
of course, to your husband also. Uh, I know he is in China right now. And yes. all our appreciation, thank you. We are very thankful for all your support to you and your husband. I know you will come to Mexico very soon. Hopefully we can search to meet you in the in the next month in in the college in the national congress of the mexican critical care college Thank it was you. really a pleasure for me to share all this discussion with you it was interesting very exciting i'm really very very happy to be among uh, among you this uh, evening for me the noon for you <laughs> and um, uh, a really a very nice experience you are doing uh, juan you are doing an excellent job and i'm just encouraging you to continue this because this will improve the critical care in mexico and for the young colleagues and young this is really excellent and amazing uh, work uh, job that you are doing uh, Thank thanks you. a lot good luck for all of you and uh, see you probably soon in mexico yes. thank you all thank you so thank much you. It was bye. a very huge experience thank, thank you, so you very much, much. Bye. Thank you. Bye, thank bye, you. bye 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 bye